down in a canister and normally there's like six canisters in like an XC20, MVE XC20. Uh, when you have it down in that canister and it's full, all of these goblets are full of liquid nitrogen. So that if you have to pull it up to the top of the tank for a little while, the straws, except for about that much of them, are still submerged in nitrogen for several seconds or maybe even turns into minutes. So that let's say uh, you sell two straws of semen to the gentleman in the back. What you would do, the, the semen is already going to be in straws here, and it's going to be down in there cold and frozen to minus 300, 320. You'll take the new cane, you'll put it down in, you'll raise the canister up, and you'll put it down in there, and you get it cold too and full of nitrogen. And sometimes you have to push down on them because they try to float like a boat. Anyway, you get it down to the same temperature as the one that's in there. And then you pull the canister up and you get a hold of these two and you straighten the cane tab on the top on these two and you dunk it again. You do it as fast as you can and you go back go in back the tank in because each time you hear that sizzle when it goes back in there, it has warmed up. And if you've got exposed straws, each time you hear that sizzle, it's gotten warmer than you really wanted it to and you've probably lost some semen cells even though it didn't completely thaw. So when you go back down for the second time after getting this, when you come back up, you take your fingers and you grab these two and you pull it up just to the top of the tank, just to where you can get a straw. And as quick as you can, you get it and you put it in the other one and you dunk it again. And then you do that two times, five times, but as much as you can, you keep it in nitrogen and then you pull it up, you make the quick switch. It's still in liquid inside the goblet and you've done minimal damage to the straw. The way that if I, and I'm not set up here because I flew, uh, you can buy a cake pan from Walmart. You can set it out on this table. And if every canister, if, if every cane in your tank is set up like this one, with a top goblet and a bottom goblet, and the, and the cane tab is down, the straws can't get out. They're all trapped and they can't find a way out. So that you can take a cake pan and set it out on this table and take your, your tank and pour liquid nitrogen into that cake pan about this deep and then you put your two you put your two uh, 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 canes and goblets in here and then you get a pair of tweezers cheap tweezers and you do all the all the switching underneath liquid and there's absolutely zero damage to semen so with that said i mean there's a lot can go into this uh, but everybody buys this online semen and they buy it like it's the best semen ever. But all I can say is buyer beware because the more times that that semen has changed hands, the more chance there is of damage to that semen and not being the quality you expected it to be. So uh, I'm sure there's more that I can elaborate on. Any questions on this so far? Okay, just some simple little uh, uh, semen handling 101 there. So. With that what, said, what's the lowest your semen tank you're getting at nitrogen level? Okay, so your average semen tank, like an XC20 or an MBE uh, 3418, and I'll go a little ways with that. Okay, when you see a semen tank and it's got it's got two numbers like 3418, you know what that stands for? The, the number 34 tells you that there's 34 liters of liquid nitrogen in that tank. And the 18 is, is the expected number of weeks that it will hold from the time it's full until the time it goes hot. So an XC20 is 20 liters, and some of them say 2020. It holds 20 liters of uh, liquid nitrogen, and it's designed to hold for 20 weeks. 34, 18, 34 liters of nitrogen in an 18 week hold time on it. So 34 doesn't mean it's gonna last longer than a 20. So the, the 34 means it, it holds another 14 liters of nitrogen. But it doesn't necessarily extend. The bigger the tank, the less the hold time. The bigger the tank, the less the hold time. Okay, Normally, that's good. as a rule of thumb. Okay. You can get some extended and there'll be an EXT dash something. And basically, it ends up being a bigger tank with more insulation on the inside so that uh, it basically it has a longer hold time, but it doesn't hold as many straws. Oh, okay. 
Normally the canisters will be smaller and that allows for more insulation on the inside. It's a bigger tank with a longer hold time. It doesn't normally hold as many straws as something of that outside dimension uh, in comparison. So is there a certain size that you recommend for, for some of the breeders? Like if, if Angela is looking for a tank, is there a, a certain size that you'd recommend for her? So for, for, the, uh, for the normal breeder, and XC20 is perfect. MB XC20, and there's other tank manufacturers, but that 20 liter, 20 week tank uh, holds basically 600 straws. It'll hold 60 canes, and these canes are designed for five straws in the bottom, five in the top. Okay, so each cane holds normally 10 straws, and if they were all full, an XC20, MB XC20 holds 600 straws, and that's as many as a normal more goat breeder will, will need. The other thing that I want to say, because I failed to mention it, the more I talk, the more I realize what I've forgotten as part of being my age. But uh, a lot of people, yeah, I get a lot of shipments in. And I'll get a, and shippers are a little different deal, but uh, I'll get, I'll get, uh, just last week I got three straws of Smoking Express, and you guys know what that's worth these days. They were in the bottom of here, with no top goblet, okay? The only thing that saved me, of course we always dump the canister when we're done to make sure there's nothing in the bottom. I knew I had three straws coming because I sent the tank out. There were only two when it got there. They had all, one had already come out in transit and then I had to dump the canister out on screen to get it and put it back in there. So always protect those straws by having something above. Now, I like to put my partial uh, canes. A lot of people will go ahead and put one straw in the top, but you got to you got to keep in mind this 20 week tank. You know, by by week uh, by week 15 or 16 is now half full. Okay, so that there's no liquid in the top half of it. Uh, an average 20 week tank is going to be 40 millimeters deep. Okay, at full de at, at, at completely full liquid, it's going to be 40 milliliters. So by the time you come down to 20 milliliters, most of this is already exposed. Now, if you take that cork out and it's a windy day or somebody opens two doors in the room and you got circulation of air, guess what it's going to do inside that tank? Mm -hmm. And so you've got warmer air circulating in the top end of that tank above that liquid and you're thawing these upper straws. So I always try to put as many straws as I can in bottom goblets, even though you've got to waste another goblet. But to protect it, to keep it in there. So, it's food for thought, especially with me when I'm sending it out to customers, I may uh, take every means to try to protect the semen because I know what it's worth. Any questions? I mean, that, that my presentation is not anything fancy, it's just little things that I feel like you need to know. And at any time, you just, you just uh, if you got a question, you just let me know. Also, I don't have very many, but I got some flat rock koozies and some business cards if you need them. And there's a few flat rock pins there for anybody who might want them. So let's move on with the presentation. Let's see if I know how to run it. Maybe I don't. Let's turn it around. Whoops. Why did I just do? Well, we may have to adjust the screen just a bit. Table of it. That'll work. That may be easy. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about buck collection. Uh, how many of you guys have bucks that you either have collect, uh, collected or want to collect? Okay. So with buck collection, a lot of people think, hey, Flat Rock putting on a buck collection, I'll just take my buck in and get some good semen put up. Well, there's a few factors that play into that. Uh, once a buck gets to us, we do everything's mechanics for us. We're going to jump that buck, we're going to catch him uh, either with an AV, uh, jumping a doe and heat, or, or uh, some of them that won't jump and are too timid to probe and force them to ejaculate into the collection uh, uh, tube. But factors that affect semen quality. First of all, is proper condition. And if we're in the, in, in the warmer part of the year and we got a buck that's just mud fat, then he also gets fat around those testicles and the fat offers an insulation which makes the semen lesser quality. So bucks that are too fat, uh, 
obviously is detrimental to the receiving quality. And thin bucks that are too thin, now I'm not talking about a buck that's running in the pasture with mineral and good, and good flesh and just doesn't have any real conditioning on, on it. I'm talking about bucks that are thin because they've either been sick or because they're anemic for parasites. So the bucks that are extremely uh, thin, uh, the first thing that's going to go whenever a buck or doe starts uh, failing in, in body score, their reproduction is the first thing to leave. Keep that in mind. Uh, another factor uh, that affects semen quality is any kind of semen stress. And it, semen stress can happen for a number of reasons. Uh, and the first one is extreme temperature change. And right now, I mean, it's a perfect time for collecting your buck. Whereas in season we can be, temperatures are perfect. You know, it's not too hot, hot. We haven't had any extreme cold. And so right now we're perfect. But when we start getting in the, uh, in the teens, especially if we get in the teens and 20s with, with uh, wet conditions with a lot of rain, that starts stressing those bucks and it starts affecting the semen quality. As long as they're active, they'll probably still be okay then because uh, activity, and we're going to uh, cover that in a minute, uh, bucks that continue to breed uh, several times a week, uh, they'll be okay longer than those that are just laying around in a cold barn or in a cold shed and it's, uh, you know, 12 degrees and they're stressed from that. So, uh, uh, hot, too hot and too cold are big factors in semen stress. Uh, any type of fever, any type of fever is going to affect semen quality. And the normal reason for fever is some type of infection. Uh, you would not believe, because I, I previously was employed with a firm that did a lot of uh, uh, bull collection. Okay? And they bring those bulls in and they'll collect them on uh, on Mondays and Thursdays, twice a week, until they get you know their 10,000 straws or whatever they want on those bulls. You would be amazed, they'll come in and that semen is just smoking hot. You know, it's in the 70s and 80s on the post stall the percentage. And then we noticed, or we did notice then, you notice the, uh, the semen quality starting to taper off. And you're thinking, huh? Did we change feed? What happened? This and, and you have a, a just a just a slow decline in semen quality, and like three weeks later, then you'll start seeing visible signs of hook rot, the infection in that hook. And I'm telling you, you can have decline in semen up to three weeks prior to be able to find the condition or the infection in that buck or bull. So, food for thought. Uh, it, it's, it's huge. So if you bring us a buck, a buck that's carrying a leg or limping on one, you know, I just shake my head because normally that's going to affect your semen quality. The, and I've already talked about the body condition and parasites. Parasites, uh, they're very detrimental because you know with parasites uh, you get anemia. And like I said, as the body uh, starts failing, the first thing they give up is uh, the ability to reproduce. So keep that in mind. Inactivity. We have people like this time of year bring us bucks and it looks really good. Uh, we collect it, uh, we extend it out, we're thinking, man, we're in the upper 80s. We're like 85, 86 percent uh, fresh on, on the fresh semen. And then we'll freeze it and then all of a sudden we're in the mid 30s to low 40 percentile on the post stall. That is because of inactivity, and so you don't see a lot of dead with their stress because of the age of that semen, okay? And you don't see it up front, but you see it on the on the back end after the freeze. It just doesn't take the freeze process as well uh, because they're older semen cells. So, the other thing that affects it, and there are many others, but uh, medications, and uh, so, Anything that's had any buck or bull that's had any type of steroid, is, their semen will be affected. And it could be affected in a lot of different ways. You could have uh, the, uh, abnorm ab abnormalities. You could have some accurate zone and head problems. You could have bent tails. Uh, but any type of steroid will affect that. And there are other medications. I'm not the vet. I can't tell you all of them. But I know any type of steroid is going to be detrimental to semen quality. Do you know how long after steroids use 
that amazingly, affects us I think anymore? Our, amazingly, I think this next one. Oh, gotcha. Will be able to do that. <laughs> Formatogenesis. Formata That's my $20 word for the day, folks. Okay? So, basically, spermatogenesis uh, means the life cycle of a semen cell. And the life cycle of a semen cell from the time that it's formed until the time it's matured is 63 days. So, you just ask the question for how long can it affect the quality of that semen? Once they're given any type of steroid, it can affect it for up to 63 days. Uh, and part of that's uh, uh, part of that's cut off, and I don't know how we fix that without moving the table a little bit. Let's see if we can do this. Now. There we go. Okay. So everybody thinks that, hey, the semen's bad on this buck, so we're just going to breed him to one or two does and bring him back and it's going to fix it. But the more you breed them, the more you clean them out, the more that you uh, encourage new semen cell production. But the fact is that once the damage is done, it may take several weeks and up to two months to get it back perfect. And you guys need to realize that. You can't rebuild Rome in a day. Okay. But yeah, uh, one or two collections or one or two uh, uh, breedings of does is not going to fix it. It could take some time. Uh, so, and that's what it says in the next one. So I've already uh, so we basically covered all that. What you do today is going to affect them for two months. Okay. So sometimes bucks they don't have the sex drive. They don't have the libido that they should. And uh, a lot of times it's because they're young and just hadn't figured things out yet. And other times, they, it happens a lot in show bucks. Okay? They got their mind on eating instead of on girls. For lack of a better term, that's just the way it is. They're so stinking fat that they, uh, and I'm as guilty as everybody else. I judge shows and I don't like the obese ones that are pushing pones behind their elbows and all that. But in general, our show bucks are too heavy. Uh, and they're, they're thicker and they're prettier and they're, they're, they're fresher haired and all that. But the fact of the matter is when we have a buck collection day in Flat Rock, the best semen will come from this yellow, nasty looking buck that they just pulled out of a group of 40 dubs. And that's a dude that's been out working for a living, and I promise you, his semen will be golden. I mean, it's always there. And then sometimes this time of year, we can get uh, post uh motility rates up in the uh, mid 80s, 84, 85%, which is almost as good as most fresh semen. You know? So, uh, the things that you do to encourage libido, feed. Okay, and I'll talk about Purple Vision. You just got to listen uh, to a seminar on that. And obviously, they have some good balanced feeds. And they're as good as anybody out there in having good balanced rations for a, for a number of different reasons. Uh, and so, but if you don't have Purple Vision available, there are a number of companies out there that have good quality, well balanced feeds. And uh, so you need to look for that. The worst thing that you can do on the buck side, the worst thing that you can do is to go buy a cattle ration and feed your buck. Because you go, you go to pumping that grain into it and pretty soon there's no ammonium chloride in there and you be stoned up and you can't feed because he's full of uh, calculi. So make sure that all of your buck rations have a, a, a balance and a good balanced ration for goat and have ammonium chloride in uh, Minerals, uh, I personally, and I know there's a lot of good minerals out there, but Vitafirm Concepte goat mineral is golden, guys. I don't know the better one out there. Regardless of where you live, if you can get your hands on that, you feed it to everything on your place that you care about. Worth every dime. Worth it, and it's expensive. But it's working, and so they'll eat the heck out of it for a while, and then sometimes you'll put it out and they won't eat it. And I've heard, heard had people tell me, my goats won't eat by the firm, except they go. They don't need it. They'll start eating it when they need it. And uh, it's, uh, it's as good as they get. Uh, so, and there are some supplements that encourage libido and bucks. Uh, right Factor has one. Tyson Rules Macho Man. 
I've seen it in, in action. I've had some breeders that have had some of the high-end bucks, uh, national champions, and brought them to us. They really didn't want to jump, didn't have a lot of drive to them. And in about 30 days on Macho Man changed them a buck. So, uh, and I know on some of these prepared rations, uh, you got to be careful on some of these top dresses. If you're going to use the top dress, don't go over with their recommended amount because, as they said earlier in their presentation, you, you go to feed off label and go to feed them more, uh, you can uh, you can raise the phosphorus levels and cost calculi that way too. So, uh, and on the other hand, I mean, I know people that have taken. Uh, Vitafirm can set a goat mineral and mix it with their daily feed as they dump it to them. Don't do that. It's formulated for, for them to, to eat what they need. And if you go to force feeding a mineral like that to them, pretty soon you're going to have them on copper overload and you're going to wonder, people are going to say, well, my buck, he, he's got pneumonia. He can't breathe. That, that, that's not pneumonia. That's, that's kidney and liver failure from copper overload. That's what that is. I had a guy tear me up on Facebook for that, but there's a reason why I tell people that. It's because it's the truth. And he said, you know, there's no data. The data is in the fact uh, that I've seen a lot of bucks, and they're always your best ones that die when you force feed them a mineral that's high in copper. So don't do it. And when they die, take and test them because I guarantee it's high. Yes, every time. And we've had, we've had them send, uh, basically we, we've just had them ship us the organs and we take it and have it tested, yeah. and it's always come high in coffee. So there's no data out there except for experience. Okay. Okay, this is just plain simple stuff. I'm gonna call this uh, section Flush Plus. These are just some things according to Ron and Dr. Kyle Onan that make your flush better, okay? Uh, in the flush room, uh, some of the advantages are factors that offer advantages in the flush room. Uh, first of all, use a qualified and if possible licensed profession. Okay? There's a lot of good people out there, and I'm not saying they have to be a vet. It's a plus if they're a vet because they don't have any trouble legally prescribing drugs. But be careful because there's a lot of people out there that claim to be an expert and you really don't want your, your prize uh, show no butcher dog. So uh, use people that are that are professional and uh, very competent and preferably licensed to do your work. Nutrition, we just talked about nutrition, okay? But I'm gonna take it to the next level. When you start a, a dough on a protocol, from, from the time you put the cedar in, you want increased energy, you want increased carbs, to, to provide more energy because we've already stated on the buck side that if you're not gaining and have extra energy and if you're losing the first thing you give up is your reproductive uh, possibilities okay so you want you want this doe to have plenty of energy as she goes through the protocol all the shots the fertilization the flushing and likewise with your reset my recips go on a pound of cracked corn the time the, uh, the the time that we put the cedars in those recipient does, and they stay on a pound of cracked corn along with their hay uh, up until the 45 days past whenever they go ahead and ultrasound bread. And so as long as you've got your donors and your recips on the gain with the in increased energy, you don't have to worry about uh, you know a lack of feed or getting bumped back from the feeder at some big overpowering dominant doe getting theirs and and losing their ability to reproduce. Okay. Ron, yes. Uh, the, so your your research, you, you say they're getting hay and crap corn. Either pasture, good good pasture or hay. And uh, I will say this, I don't like alfalfa hay. Alfalfa hay increases the nitrates and I personally feel like that is detrimental to a flush program. Really? Okay. If you're going to feed alfalfa, feed grassy alfalfa. Okay. About a 50-50 deal. But as long as you've got a good balanced ration going in them, you don't need that extra. You don't need that extra feed potential of that alfalfa. 
and alfalfa is high in nitrates and it changes things in the in the donor and in the recent okay and I'm, I'm not I'm not a big proponent of alfalfa uh, at one time I thought man that's the cheapest goat feed I could feed and I guess if that's all you were feeding them was alfalfa hay and mineral it would probably be okay but nobody does it okay so uh, anything else on that but yeah energy increased energy from the time of the cedar until the, the flush on the donor and all the way up through the 45 days and in the confirmation of, uh, of pregnancy on the recent. So the other thing that I can, the other advantage is to flush donors in this window, 10 months to two years old. And I know that you can go older than that, but I'm telling you that that age is golden. I mean, they're clocked and ready to spit out numbers of embryos and quality of embryos, all right? Uh, 10 to 24 months. And then if they work, then you turn around and try the ones that do really well again. But if you can focus on that age group, you stand a higher chance of having a successful flush time. So you always want, say you bring me donors, I want them there at least by cedar time. People that bring me donors the day before the shop start, they stand less than a 50% chance of being successful because of the stress level in those does and changing, changing their surroundings. And that goes back to acclimation to your surroundings. Uh, acclimation of the environment and surroundings. Yeah. So another factor, good constant weather. And when these weather's up and down and you don't have any control over that, but if that weather is up and down, uh, you know, especially during shots and during the breeding, uh, it's detrimental on flush days. We just had a huge flush at our place on Tuesday. We had some up and down weather and everything was, was spot on 12 o'clock and I'm thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. We had a little rain during the breeding and then it got rocky in between the breeding and the flush day. And, uh, we, uh, we had oh, a third of those donors that did work out. 14, I think we got, I think we got 10 of the 14 to work and do decent. So, uh, weather is everything. Seasonality, this time of year, you can expect your best results from a flush. Uh, I'm gonna say on an average from October through mid to late December, if you flush 12, 10 of them ought to work, okay? <coughs> We get up into April, if you flush 12 in April, six of them are gonna work, about half. We get into July, if you flush 12, eight or nine of them are gonna work, but then when we get back into this time of year, it's golden. I mean, this is natural breeding season for goats, and it's never any better than that. So, and the other thing, last but not least, a, a doe's ability to make a great donor and produce numbers of embryos and quality of embryos is genetic. So as you go through this barn this weekend and look at those, and anytime you go to a sale, you're never out of line by asking the breeder. Do you flush the mother? Is this from a line that produces good numbers? And if so, how many on an average does her mama and her grandma produce? And they're working. Most, the truth of the matter is most breeders are not gonna sell you those out of their best producing, best flushing mother. That maternal line is huge, and that's what keeps people in business. And they may sell them, and if they do, you go ahead and pay the premium because it'll normally, normally give you results and will save you money. Because what we do isn't cheap, and it's sure it's sure not cheap to feed them. So feed and reproduction, as far as services and costs, are expensive. If you can start with one that's a known breeder and a known producer, you're money ahead every time. So, we'll, we'll touch base on that in a minute. Are there any questions? Anything else that you can think of that I can help you with? Because this is short and sweet, but it's all just basic stuff. A lot of you already know that I'm just hitting the high spots. Any questions at all? So, if not, uh, Again, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I've got some uh, 
We've got some uh, contact information. Uh, you can check us out on our website or on Facebook. Uh, our address is here. I've got my number there, but I've got cards available up here with both mine and Dr. Onan and, and Brennan. Dr. Onan obviously is our vet that does all the surgery. Brennan Lewis is our embryologist. He's certified at Colorado State University uh, and, and is uh, licensed to run, uh, set up and run an IVF lab. That's our next endeavor. Uh, we've already, we're already under contract with Transova. It's just gotten so busy that we haven't got together for a satellite run. Hopefully now, we know it's not gonna happen in December, maybe in January, where we'll be aspirating and doing an IVF at Flat Rock. So we've got a bright future ahead. But our future depends on you. And I know you guys don't necessarily live uh, next door to us. But, I mean, if we can put together enough over here to justify the trip, I'd love to come, come to Kentucky. It's a beautiful state, good people, and I appreciate you. So if anybody's got questions, feel free to come up and ask personally. And uh, thank you for your time. I, we haven't done enough of it on the goat side. I, I ran from it. For a, for a long time, but I feel like we're close enough now that it's time for Flat Rock to pursue it. Uh, I will tell you, embryo rates, hold rates are not as good as conventional. Uh, on the uh, on, on the fresh side, putting the fresh embryos in seems to be fairly good. There, <laughs> there's a competitor. I'm not gonna name any names. This is promising everyone in the world. But I'm going to give you numbers you can count on. If you aspirate a doe and continue to do so, or a group of does, you can count on an average of four live kids for aspiration. And you're going to have between four and five hundred dollars a kid invested in them when they hit the ground. Okay? I don't think it's for young does unless you plan on using some rare high dollar semen. Okay? If you got $2,500 straw semen, or even $1,500, uh, you stand less chance of losing that on the IVF side because fertilization is happening in the ditch. It's mainly focused on older donors that have been great producers that either don't breed or don't flush anymore. So, but I just told you the numbers, and it will get better with time. But you can count on four live births per aspiration on the average. Don't hold me to it if you if you aspirate one and get a zero. But the next time you may do one and get 20. And that's been known to happen too. But I'm a guy that tries to tell you the truth. That's where it's at right now. So, any questions on IVF? Yes, thank you. So, what happens is, with IVF, you know, it's an eight-shot protocol for a donor that, for a donor that you're uh, conventionally flushing. It's only a three-shot protocol, three shots of faltropin or FSA uh, for the IVF side, which means that you don't have to wait 60 to 90 days before you re -rack. So that we can aspirate a donor every 30 days, okay? But what happens is, sometimes people, wow, I've got 45 oocytes, and that's great, but that don't mean you're going to have anything when it's done. So we ship those oocytes to Transova's lab, and then they, they go ahead and incubate them, and they fertilize them in the dish, and then they're sent back to us for fresh. And if we, got, if we know we're limited on numbers of recepts, then they just send us the fresh that we need. And they freeze those right there in the lab the day of because they're better the quicker you get them frozen. But what happens is, even though you put them in, and this isn't just with IVF, it's with conventional flushing too. You put them in and 45 days later, you confirm uh, pregnancy on a bunch of recent. That don't mean they're gonna carry a full term. Because amazingly, Mother Nature has a way of getting rid of the problem children, okay? And so, if there's a problem, when we're mass producing these, sometimes we make some deformities and abnormalities, and good old Mother Nature will take care of that, so that they don't end up carrying full term. Because, you know, so what I'm trying to say is, at 45 days, that's awesome if you've got a 70% hold rate, but it may be less uh, as an end result because Mother Nature takes care of some of it for you. Okay. Anything else?
Guys, it's been a pleasure. I thank you for your time. Anybody else has questions, just feel free to come up. Okay?